Hey there, welcome to the Caledonia Gathering. My name's Corey, and we're so glad that you're here. You know, whether you are watching from home or you've joined one of our house gathering watch parties, you know, we, we're so glad that you're here. It's it's really our mission to tell people about the life and the love of Jesus and to inspire you to learn to live and love like him. And so if, if that's something that you're interested in and you haven't done so already, I want to encourage you to go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below. Also, if you've got kids uh, somewhere, you know, around or below the age of seven, our, our family ministries director, Johanna, and her volunteers have put together a video experience just for your kids, and you can find that in the link in the description below as well. It, today, we're going to be uh, continuing our series called Wayback Playback, where we look at some of the songs in scripture that give honest expression to the human experience. But, but before we jump into today's message, let's get our hearts and our minds in the right place by, by singing together. We are here for you. 
God of love be welcomed in this place. A number of years ago, I started a new position at a local college. I was working with students who were living on campus there. After getting hired, my boss, Nate, invited me and some of the other new hires over for dinner with his family one night. And it was supposed to be so that we could get to know one another. Now, I've never been invited by a boss over for dinner, so I, I kind of thought, well, even though I'm nervous, maybe it's no big deal, it's just dinner. As we sat around the table, a group of about 10 of us there in their shady backyard, um, Nate and his wife, Amina, began asking us questions. Simple at first, really easy questions, but you could kind of tell there was some intentionality to it. It started with the question, where did you grow up and what were winters like there? What were the colder months like there? Some people kept their answers short, some were long, and, and many of them told stories. The follow-up question was, was, in those winter months, where was the warmest place in your home? Again, fairly innocuous, people talked about fireplaces or a particularly overactive vent or a favorite piece of furniture. But by this point, people's comfort levels started to grow as, as we bonded over similar experiences, telling stories, and we marveled over our uniqueness and differences. And then another follow-up. Who was the warmest person in your home? Okay. That things started to get a little bit more real in the conversation. People started talking about relationships with parents and siblings. The, the stories began taking on a, a little bit more of a serious tone as people shared about tension and loss and, and grief and deep joy and satisfaction and hardship. What they missed most about home or what they were really glad they didn't have to deal with anymore. I mean, so much for just dinner. Things really started to get real. We were really getting to know one another. And then they got realer. Nate asked, has God ever been warm for you? And if so, when? And, and if not, why do you suppose not? I, I remember thinking to myself as we, we sat around that table, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about home, sharing our ideas about home, our memories and our stories about home, and what the best version of home is for us. We're not talking about God. And yet we were. We just didn't realize it at the time. And that's really what our Wayback Playback is all about today. We're going to read Isaiah 55. And at first glance, it's going to seem like a song that's just about going home and the joys and the hopes and maybe some of the struggles that go with that idea of going home. But, but all the while, the idea of going home, it kind of keeps getting intertwined with this idea of forging or reforging a new relationship with God. That really, being close-knit with God is the ultimate homecoming that we're all longing for. But before we jump in and read it, uh, for ourselves, I think it's important to understand the bigger context of why it was written. You see, Isaiah 55 was written to the nation of Judah, to, to the Jewish people, as they sat in exile in Babylon. Now, Babylon was no longer in charge anymore when this was written. Um, it, they were under the reign of the Persian Empire, which means not their land, not their rule, not their religion, not their lives, and certainly not the life they wanted. Now, the first Persian conqueror was named Cyrus. He was the king that took over from Babylon. And Cyrus, unlike other dictators, had no problem with his subjects practicing different religions. And so he actually allowed some of the Jewish exiles to, to go back home, back to Jerusalem, back to rebuild their city and their temple. But shortly after Cyrus was killed, his successor put a stop to that whole rebuilding effort. He, he believed that if the Jews went home and rebuilt their city and their religion, it would start to cause division in the empire, and that would be a problem. So... So he put a stop to it. And then he was killed. And he was succeeded by a new king named Darius. And Darius reinstated the Jews' ability to go back home and, and continue the rebuilding effort. But they would still have to be royal, loyal subjects to the Persian Empire. Now, as you could imagine, this sat differently with different people. Some people saw it as blessing. They saw it as a huge blessing that, that at least they could go home. And, and others saw it as kind of an insult that they would still be required to serve the Persians even though they were living back home. 
and other people saw going home unnecessary altogether. I mean, they had adapted to the Persian way of life. They had adopted uh, life altogether in Babylon. And everyone wondered, what is God up to in the midst of all of this sort of political turnover, tumultuous, churning mess? What is God doing? Is, is he abandoning us? Is, is he helping us? Is he hurting us? What's the plan here? And so the voice of Isaiah sort of rings through all these questions with this song that's supposed to be the answer. This is what God is doing. And so this is what he says. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what's not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love that I promised to David. See, I've made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you don't know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Now, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous, uh, let them forsake their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And he will, uh, uh, and turn to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. As rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to heaven without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It, It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Now you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. Instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. And this will all be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. If I could retitle this from Isaiah 55 to to something else, I would title this song um, The Invitation. And there are three parts to this song called The Invitation. The first is The Invitation, the second is The Contemplation, and the third is The Restoration. Invitation, then Contemplation, then Restoration. But let's start with the first, The Invitation. You know, the Persian king Darius has reinstated the possibility for the Jews to go home and rebuild their old lives. And so Isaiah sort of lyrically issues this invitation to return home as though he's inviting people on behalf of God to a party. He says, come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Are you longing? Are you thirsty? Are you hungry for home? Come home. Come home like a college student where the food is on the table, the wine's being poured, and you don't have to pay for any of it. Stop wasting your life in Babylon and just come home. Every day you spend over there, every day you spend over there, you are spending on bread and labor that doesn't satisfy. You don't want that life. Come home where the food is good and you can delight in the best desserts. Listen to me. Come back to the land of Judah. It's better for you here. That's kind of where it starts, this this invitation Um, to an address. It's it's really a geographical invitation. But then partway through this invitation, uh, things shift a little. It it goes from a geographical invitation, hey, come home to this address in Judah, um, to a relational invitation. It's not just an invitation to come home and and return. It's an invitation to return to a relationship with God. Isaiah says, listen so that you may live. I'll make an everlasting covenant with you. Covenant's a biblical word for relationship, an arrangement between two parties. Now, I say they're re-entering a relationship because when Judah got exiled to Babylon in the first place, it, it was punishment for violating the initial arrangement and relationship that they were supposed to have with God. 
In other words, this song is, is like God is saying to them, I used exile to punish you for violating our relationship, but enough is enough. It's time to come home, home geographically and home relationally. But, but the invite, it's interesting, doesn't stop with the Jewish people. Surprisingly, in verse 4 and 5, um, Isaiah sort of widens it on behalf of God. The invitation goes to more than just his own people. He says, I made David a ruler and commander of nations. In other words, it was David's job to lead you in such a way that all other nations would look and see that life under your God was the best kind of life, and, and that would cause them to want to flock to you. And, and that hope, that plan still stands. I'm not just inviting you to come home. You're going to summon everyone else, nations you previously didn't know. They're going to want to come be a part of this because of the way your God is treating you, forgiving you, showing mercy to you, welcoming you back. Everyone's going to want to be a part of that. And the good news is that this invitation is it's not just for you. It's for everyone. Everyone is invited. Now, the second part of the song is the contemplation. That invitation requires some contemplation. To go home is, is really to return to a roof that has rules. And so the invitation should be contemplated because it's going to require that the wicked give up their way of life. It's going to require that the unrighteous people give up their thought patterns. In other words, the way you see the world and live in the world and think about the world may need to change, says Isaiah. Because as God says, my ways are not your ways. My way of thinking is not your way of thinking. My, my way of doing is not your way of doing. My plans are not your plans. Now, what I think is really striking about that invitation to contemplation is that Isaiah is actually talking to his own people. When he talks about the wicked and the unrighteous, he's not talking about the pagan Persians. He's, he's talking about his own people. Basically, he's saying, look, if God's going to use this pagan Persian king Darius to show us mercy and bring us back home, we might need to change the way we think and live. I mean, God's way is clearly not the same way as our way. And his plan is clearly not the same as, as our plans. I mean, case in point, I would not have thought that God was going to use a pagan Persian king to rescue us from exile and to help rebuild our lives back home. I mean, isn't God only supposed to use holy, righteous, and perfect people to accomplish his will? Apparently not. Apparently, God's got a plan that is much higher and more far-reaching than just us and our personal lives, says Isaiah. And, and he's going to get it done. I mean, you know how rain falls on the earth and eventually evaporates, making its way back to the sky? Well, it never does so without getting the job done on earth to help plants grow. And in the same way, when, when God says, I'm going to do something, I promise to do something, his word is, is not going to return without accomplishing its goal. The question is, are you going to be on board with that? Are you going to get on board with what he's up to? Are you interested in submitting to his plan and his will? Or are you going to go on laboring for, for your own thing? Your own thing that, that truly in the end doesn't satisfy. See, the invitation to come home is one that requires contemplation. Are you willing to leave your old way of thinking and living for God's? But before you decide, Part three of the song offers one more thing, a picture of home. It's really a picture of restoration. Should you decide in your contemplation to receive that invitation, you get to come home to restoration. He says you're going to be led out of exile with joy. You're going to finally find peace. The land itself is going to be praising God. It's, it's kind of a silly image, the idea of trees clapping their hands and mountains dancing and singing. But the point is, home is a place filled with joy and peace. It's a place where evergreen trees grow instead of thorn bush bushes. Now, thorn bushes and briars that, that Isaiah mentions, they're wild plants that spring up when no one's paying attention to the field or the garden. The contrast here is it's between a land that's being cared for and one that's being neglected. Home is the place of care, not neglect. In other words, are you hungry for peace? Are you thirsting for joy? Then come home. Are you worried that you don't have anything to offer once you walk in the door? Don't worry about it. The entire party's already been prepared and already been paid for. Just come home. I mean, that's really the point of Isaiah's song. Come home to your land. Come home to your Lord. 
you know, I, I think it's interesting. Jesus actually told a very similar story during his time on earth. It was about this young man who had decided that, that he was tired of living under his father's roof with his father's rules. I mean, sure, there were benefits to living at home, but the truth is it, it just no longer felt like a warm place to him. And, and so he was certain that, that he could do better on his own. And so he, he massively offended his father and then left. He, his father didn't exile him. He kind of exiled himself. He was convinced that life would be better without his dad. And so he lived for himself. And he loved himself. And then when he ran out of resources, he kind of had no one to help him. He was by himself. He was homeless. He was hungry. And so he started thirsting for home. And, and then he began the journey. The journey of leaving his old life, leaving the way of thinking, leaving the way of living in hopes of embracing something new. Now, as Jesus told this story, everyone listening assumed that when the father saw this son coming in the distance, trying to get back home, his, his mind would have been flooded with all of the pain that his son caused him. I mean, the disrespect, the shame, the anger, the resentment. I mean, this boy looked his own dad in the face and said, I wish you were dead. He took half his money and then he laughed. He embarrassed his father. He, he broke the relationship in order to go live life his own way. And so when his father saw the son coming, everyone assumed that he'd be flooded with all of those memories and, and then be filled with a rage enough to deck him or ignore him or, or reject him and tell him to get lost. You're no son of mine. All of which would have been entirely acceptable in that culture. But when he saw his son coming, he ran to him. He jumped off the porch and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him and he said, you're home, you're home, you're home. And then he told everyone he could find, he's home, my son is home. And then you know what he did? He, he threw him a party. Wine, milk, bread, meat. He threw him a huge party. Now, do you think the son has anything to offer for the party? Do you think the son can afford to pay for the cost of his own homecoming? Of course not. It's a gift from his dad. A gift of mercy and grace. Welcoming his child home joyfully, welcoming him back to a place of peace. Jesus' point was to, to reiterate and to update Isaiah 55 because he knew that the father in his story was the same as the God of Isaiah 55, a heavenly father longing for his children to come home. Not just home to a geographical address, but home to a relationship. And Jesus believed this so much that he was willing to give his life to make it happen. You see, that's the good news of the gospel. That, that's the heart of the Christian faith. And, and you know what? The message is the same. Whether you consider yourself a Christian or, or not, the message is always the same. Come home. Come home. Your Father in heaven is inviting you home. Come home to peace. Come home to joy. Are you worried that you're not going to have anything to offer when you walk in the door? Are you worried about the cost? Don't be. The party's already been prepared for you. And the price has already been paid. Are you worried that you're not going to fit in once you get into the party? Are you worried that maybe you're too unrighteous or you've got that one sin or... Or you believe that God won't accept you into the party unless you change first? I get it. I know that's often how Christianity gets painted. It's, it's all fake. They say they're accepting. They say they're open arms. They say they're gracious and all the rest. Until they find out that one thing about you and boom, you're out. And it's true. I can be like that sometimes. But out of curiosity... Aren't you like that sometimes too? I mean, as tolerant and, and accepting as we all claim to be and want to be, aren't there just some people that we can't wrap our head around so we don't wrap our arms around them either? I mean, don't we all draw the line somewhere? We just draw it in different places. My point is saying you're accepting and then failing to be isn't a Christian problem. It's not a religion problem. It's a, it's a people problem. 
And so that means that if you're worried about being forced to change before you can be accepted, you need to reread the opening invitation. Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Then come eat and drink what is good, even though you can't afford it. In other words, there is no entry fee for this party because it's already been paid. You see, Jesus didn't demand his disciples change before they followed him. But, but here's what changed Jesus' disciples. They were changed by what they saw. They were changed by what they experienced. In other words, there were no prerequisites for following Jesus. No one had to change in order to follow him. But you better believe that following him changed them. It's changed me. And, and I'm certain that it will change you. I don't know exactly how, but, but I promise it will be for the better. Because here's what's on the other side of following Jesus. A heavenly feast for your homecoming. A peace knowing that you are loved by the God of the universe who thought you, you, were worth dying for. And a joy in life that no circumstance can take from you as you live and serve others. So, you've received your invitation, the promise of restoration. Now, it's time for your own contemplation. What will you do? Will you decide to follow Jesus? Will you decide to, to come home to the warmth of your Heavenly Father's embrace? Now, if, if you're thinking to yourself, well, Corey, all of that sounds great, but, but what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like in my life? I'll tell you, one, one of the first things that I, I notice often people do when it comes to the message of Christianity is, is they skip ahead to what they've heard the demands are. That, that if I say yes to Jesus, and then I must do these things, and I must not do those things. Listen to me. Please listen to me. That's not the starting place. The starting place for the message of Christianity is Jesus himself. Read about his life if you haven't already. And this is for, for those of you who call yourself Christians and those of you who wouldn't. Read about the life and love of Jesus. Get to know him and then decide whether or not you want to follow him. Read the Gospel of John, who was one of his closest followers. Read the Gospel of Luke, who, who uh, thoroughly investigated all of the details. And then decide. As someone who often struggles with anxiety when in groups of people, I sometimes stress about social situations before they happen. I worry about what it's going to be like and, and how I'm going to feel while I'm there. And, and sometimes I get so stressed about a social situation that's coming up that, that I actually just avoid going in the end altogether. And maybe that's how you feel about this following Jesus thing. You've been invited to the party. But you're so worried about what it'll be like once you're there that, that you decide not to go before even giving it a shot. And, and to those of you who feel that way, I want to say, friend, come. Come home. Receive the invitation. Come home. Peace and joy are waiting for you. your heart in the stream of life let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to
Thanks so much for joining us today. You know, just a couple of things before we wrap up here together. The first is that that if you have not done so already, um, I, I really want to encourage you to sign up for the TCG 60 class where, where we talk about for just one hour, it's a one hour session where we talk about what it means to be a part of this church, where this church has been in the past, where it's headed in the future, what we value and love most and, and what we're all about. And so if that's something you're interested in, go ahead and send me an email, Corey at the Caledonia gathering.org um, with a, you know just TCG 60 sign up in the in the body or, or in the subject of the email and we'll get you signed up for that and let you know when the next class is going to be the second thing is that we want to encourage you to, to begin your generosity journey with us today if you haven't already just go ahead and flip up on your phone go to the Caledonia gathering.org slash giving and, and the reason we do that is because well the truth is I think everybody wants to be a generous person and and giving regularly with the Caledonia gathering is is one of the ways that God shapes us to be generous people and and the second reason we do it is because well uh, it's one of the ways that God invites us to be a part of his mission on earth, what, what he's doing in the world. And so um, if you haven't done so already, go ahead, start today. Let today be the beginning of your generosity journey at thecaledoniagathering.org slash giving. You'll find a drop down menu there and you can select the Caledonia Gathering. And, and the last thing is, is, well, it's kind of another way to engage the mission of this church. You know, I, I want you to think just for a minute as we wrap up what you heard today about this invitation that's gone out to you and that's gone out really to to everyone this invitation to be accepted and loved this invitation to come home to your heavenly father i wonder who in your life needs to hear that who in your life has has a mixed up view of of what christianity is about and what following jesus is like who who in your life doesn't quite know or doesn't quite get it or, or thinks it's something other than what it is, who needs to hear the message that you heard today? Is it a friend? Is it a neighbor? Is it, is it a family member? And as you think about who that person might be, that there are one of two things that I want you to do. The first is to, to maybe consider texting the link for this service and sending it to them. And that's kind of the easy one. That's an easy, that's not, not that difficult. Just, you know, put your scroller right up to the URL, copy, paste in a text message and send it off. But the second one's a little more, more in-depth. 
And this is really engaging in the mission of the church. I want to encourage you and challenge you. Whoever that person is that you think, boy, they, they really need to hear this, I want you to invite them to join you next week at your house gathering watch party or to join you next time at home as you watch it together in your living room or to join you online as you watch together at the same time next week. So just those three things. Sign up for TCG 60 if you haven't already. Uh, start your generosity journey today and, and who is it that needs to hear this? And will you take the step in faith of inviting them?